so this is now recording and welcome everybody thanks for your patience while i've been faffing around um, with all these things um, welcome to our second kurdish tuesday i'm sarah glynn i'm co-convener of scottish solidarity with kurdistan and the idea of these tuesdays is actually that there'll be different groups that are running it different themes but one diary date so we know that every other tuesday to keep it free in the diary for an, a meeting about kurdistan and kurdish issues and it's a way of bringing together an international community and it's really exciting actually that this opportunity to realize that there are all those people out there you know even outside Scotland, but you know, even further outside the UK that are taking part and that we're all part of the same thing. And I hope very much that that part can go on after we're through this pandemic. Um, though I do miss that bit of the meeting when you go for a drink afterwards and actually get a chance to really hammer things out. So yeah, I've been looking forward to meeting some of you in for real afterwards. So this meeting is actually being run by Kurdistan Solidarity Network. But just before I hand over to them, I just want to tell you about the meeting that we've got in a fortnight's time. And really excited that we've got Jan Furman, who's the lawyer who led the legal team that successfully defended the PKK or members of the PKK against charges of terrorism right up through the Belgian court system. So that will be really interesting in two weeks time but for the moment we're going to be really interested in democratic confederalism despite it being such a mouthful um, and really excited to hand over to Kurdistan Solidarity Network and Nick and just sit back I'll just sit back and listen and let a few people in um, so handing over to you Nick thanks Sarah um, and thank you so much to Scottish Solidarity with Kurdistan for the invitation um, it's really great to be here and to be talking about democratic confederalism in practice on the ground in northeast Syria uh, or Rojava. Um, just a brief intro to the Kurdistan Solidarity Network. So my name is Nick. I'm an organizer with KSN uh, based in London. Uh, and KSN is a network of local groups in the island of Britain, all in England at the moment. Um, uh, which are building practical solidarity with the uh, Rojava revolution and the Kurdish freedom movement and are uh, looking to learn specifically from the politics of this movement and to spread the ideas uh, beyond Kurdistan and in our own context. Um, and in doing this, we, it's important in the principles of the movement um, that we organize really closely with our friends in different organizations across these islands and beyond. So working really closely with Kurdish Solidarity Cymru and of course, Scottish Solidarity with Kurdistan. Um, so totally uh, agree that hopefully these, these meetings can continue in person and online beyond the current crisis. Um, and we can continue building this solidarity movement. Um, but for today, we're joined by one of our organizers, Vian, uh, to talk about democratic confederalism in practice. Um, and to start, uh, maybe Vian, you can tell us a bit about yourself and what you're going to be talking to us about today. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, it's really fantastic that there's lots of people from all different places. Um, so, as Nick said, my name is Vian. Um, I'm an organizer with Kurdish Solidarity Network, and I just sort of recently come back from a year in Rojava, where I was um, working as an internationalist volunteer, um, and I went over early last year in order to participate with the revolution and join the movement structures and see what we can learn from the movement in northeast Syria and in Kurdistan. Um, so as part of my time there, I was super lucky to be able to speak to lots of people from just sort of residents in the cities, um, people living in the villages, to people who were involved in the um, institutions and assemblies and structures um, and in positions of responsibility and talk to them about um, what is it like to live in democratic federalism. Um, how does it affect their life? And we also got to learn about the big structures and sort of like match up the 
comparison between people's lived experience of every day and then the big picture vision, the big picture structures. Um, so I'll be talking a bit about the actual structures of democratic confederalism. Um, it's important to flag up that there's also a lot of questions around political culture and practices, um, as well as the ideological background. Um, and there are other seminars that uh, we've done as Kurdistan Solidarity Network that cover those aspects, which are absolutely crucial. But today we'll focus a little bit about the political structures of the, of the political system. Thanks. So let's get into it then. So North and East Syria doesn't have a government in the traditional sense of the word. So you can, can you tell us a bit about what that means? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the reason why people um, all across the world have looked to Northeast Syria um, as an example of what direct democracy can look like at a time when all around the world were becoming more and more disillusioned with the state structures and the state governments that we live in is because it proposes a way of governance which doesn't include a government. So it's essentially society governing itself. And in the um, you know, social contracts and in the outlines of all the different assemblies and bodies, it says, we reject the concept of a state. We reject the concept of a nationalistic, capitalist, oppressive state. We see it as a relationship of domination. So instead, um, we're gonna set up a system of people governing themselves um, through a confederation. So starting from the smallest unit possible and then federating up to the biggest one. Um, I wanted to make a quick note on terminology, which is that we kind of use Rojava and Northeast Syria interchangeably. Um, Rojava generally refers to a smaller area of the three, you know, the three regions of Afrin, Kobani, and um, Jazeera, which were um, declared independent in 2012. And then Northeast Syria actually includes um, four more regions. So it's a bigger space, but they all fall under this confederation. So even though we use them kind of interchangeably, we're actually speaking about North and East Syria, which is um, a powerful population of roughly four million people um, and about a third of the area of the whole Syrian state is within this area. So it's quite a sizable chunk. Um, so when we're thinking about it, we really need to think big and not just think about, you know, kind of the much smaller scale examples. Um, so it's a counter proposition to the nation state, but it can also exist within and alongside the state, which is really interesting. So they're not trying to gain power in the Syrian state in order to gain or to gain an autonomous state. They're saying, it's fine. We're doing our own thing. We have a certain level of autonomy and we can coexist within any state structure that we happen to be existing within. And our um, goal is to build up our own power so that we either render the state irrelevant or when it comes to a con confrontation of some kind, we're able to defend ourselves against the state and assert that autonomy. Um, but it doesn't see the state as either the kind of solution um, of the, as part of democratic federalism. So it's based on a lot of principles which drive the structure, which is gender equality, um, youth empowerment, ethnic diversity, and devolved power. So the system devolves power into communes, which are usually um, between 150 and 1,000 people, so some can be a bit bigger, all the way up to this federation across the seven regions. Um, Nick, if you can pull up the picture of the general overview of the political system, we have a nice little visual aid here, which was um, provided by Rojava Information Center, who have produced um, some interesting material on this topic that I would really recommend. Um, so there's essentially three wings or three bodies of the political system of North and East Syria. Um, the one that most people kind of refer to as the governance structure is the autonomous administration of North and East Syria, sometimes also called the self-administration of North and East Syria. Um, then we also have the Syrian Democratic Council, and then we also have Tevdem. Now, these bodies have all come into being at different times. Um, the autonomous administration has only come into being in September 2018, so it's the most recent body, but it's actually taken a lot of the responsibilities that were previously held by either the Syrian Democratic Council or Tevdem, which a lot of people have heard of 
because of the history of the revolution. And it has become the governance body based on democratic and federalist principles, which takes over, which, which looks at um, all issues like education, um, economy, agriculture, transportation, health systems. So all of these things, all these essentially kind of services and ways of living and, and democratic input happen through the autonomous administration. Um, so the way that that looks like is that you have your commune in your local area, and then your communes in a neighborhood federate together and become a neighborhood, and then your neighborhoods federate together and become a sub-district, and so on, so on, up through district, canton, region, and then the full autonomous administration, north and east area, across all seven regions. Um, it's important to remember, though, that the autonomous administration isn't just that top level of all seven regions. The administration is the whole thing from the commune up to the federation. Um, and the power is devolved as much as possible um, so that if it's a question of sort of transportation between two regions, the administrations, the councils of those two regions would have to coordinate. But if it's a question of something that only affects within one region, that can be dealt with within that region. If it's a question of you know, setting up a park or cleaning up a river, a commune can handle it. If it's a question of um, a municipal question of how do we organize the, um, the cleaning services in a city, then it gets handled in the municipal assembly. So it's really about pushing stuff down as much as possible, but bringing it back up again when necessary. Um, all right, so that's the administration, the autonomous administration. Then we have the political body, which is the, what the political parties participate in and also the administration feeds into civil societies and labor unions participate into and also some um, key individuals, for example, like the uh, head military commanders will feed into and that's the Syrian Democratic Council. And they're the political vision for all of Syria. They're the ones who are actually doing more diplomatic work. So it's the Syrian Democratic Council who will be holding um, negotiations with the Assad regime. They're the ones who send a, a delegation out to um, the USA in order to speak to Congress about the you know, Turkish invasion. And they also organize um, with lots of different bodies in Syria and across Kurdistan and across the world. And then finally, you have Tevdem, which is essentially um, a way that this governance structure has incorporated and enshrined the importance of civil society and labor unions within the system. Um, so civil society, associations, community groups, um, and labor unions are held within Tevdem, and Tevdem will provide a confederated structure, again, from the commune all the way up to the inter-region level, um, which gives voice to those, um, to those bodies, to those groups. Um, and then they all feed into each other. So if you look at the diagram, if you can see at all levels, they feed into each other. They are organized by councils and committees. So they're all sitting on each other's committees. Um, and throughout this kind of like three-legged stool, the governance of the region happens. And because it's all federated from the bottom level to the top, um, it, it creates space for society to govern itself. Thank you. That's a really, a really rich overview um, and really shows what, where this system departs from the, from the kinds of systems of government that, um, that we're really used to. Um, but you pointed out the, the, um, that we often use uh, the term Rojava to refer to the, to the whole, to the whole si system. And really, we often use the phrase Rojava revolution. So what is it that makes uh, the, what, what, could you say a bit more about the political principles and the culture that this system is based on and which really makes it revolutionary? Mm -hmm. um, so I mentioned the principles it's based on. So for example, gender equality, youth empowerment, um, ethnic diversity. Um, in terms of what that looks like in practice, so for all of these structures, um, Tevdem, the, count, the Syrian Democratic Council, and the administration, there is a parallel women's structure from the, you know, from the commune level up to the interregional level. So um, whether it's in a political party or a labor union or in one of the administration councils, because they have a council on almost every level, um, 
then there is a women's parallel structure, which is fully democratic, fully autonomous, and essentially exercises um, veto power on any decision. Um, but it's not just veto, it's that they actually really shape you know, and drive and are seen explicitly as the political leadership, as the you know, vanguard of the movement, because it's really seen that um, because women have been excluded from the political system and are oppressed by the political system, oppressed by capitalism, um, they've actually found different ways of organizing and they sort of hold the heritage of democratic organizing by virtue of having been those people who've been excluded from the dominating systems. Um, so it's really um, a tangible transfer of power to women um, in a way that means that the, the system's really shaped by it. So that's kind of one way that it's practiced. Um, and just to be really clear, it's not that there's a men's structure and a women's structure. It's a general mixed structure, which already has 40% quotas for women. And then in addition to that, you have a fully autonomous women's structure. Um, each of the councils and committees um, on the administration level, um, is operates by a co-chair system. So you never have one person in charge. You always have two people in charge and it's always a man and a woman. It can never be two men. Um, in the women's structures, you often still have co-chairs, but they'll obviously both be women. Um, so if you actually think about it, even if there's a 40% minimum quota in the mixed structure, then you have 100% women organizing an equally powerful women's structure. So you kind of have like, what is that three fourths, three quarters of the people who are taking the leadership positions in the assemblies are women. Um, so it's really not a token, it's definitely not a token um, response. Uh, the youth movement is also seen as autonomous. Um, they're not usually as kind of organized, as kind of structurally organized as the women's movement, but it's really, youth are held up as also one of the leaders of the revolution um, because the analysis is that it's generally kind of the older generations, especially the older male generations, who kind of hold on to power in a conservative and dominating way. Um, so the kind of dynamism and you know visionary ability of youth is really valued. So the youth also have autonomy and they organize their own structures um, and feed into at every level. So for example, in the Syrian Democratic Council, so this you know top level council which sends um, which makes really big decisions sends diplomats out to different countries there are youth representatives in that council um, who organize with that council um, in terms of ethnic diversity there's also an insistence on representation and so if you look at the kind of committee breakdown so each committee so for example education committee women's committee economy committee um, self-defense committee, culture committee, pretty much every council has these committees. Um, we'll have two co-chairs and two vice co-chairs, again, um, half women, half men. And every um, ethnic community who lives in an area will be represented in the committees um, that make up a council. So if there are a handful of Turkmen or Circassians or a large minority or a majority of one ethnicity or another, they will always be represented. It's not a proportional representation because it's saying it doesn't matter if there's only, you know, 30 Turkmen families in this city, um, they should be represented even if, you know, then there's 90%, you know, Kurdish or, you know, 50% Arab and 45% Kurdish um, and really insisting that minorities don't just get trampled over as well. Thanks, that's a really rich answer. Um, so I have lots more questions, particularly thinking about how, how what, what it would look like translating um, some of these practices into our own context. Um, but maybe at this point, um, we could get some more uh, questions from the, from the people who are in the call at the moment. Um, and uh, and yeah, hear what they've got to say. So I've got a first uh, question from Neil. Hi there. I wonder if you could say something about the economic structures that you've got in the area, perhaps to do with the cooperatives that I believe are there, and how how people trade, how people do commerce, stuff like that. That's that'd be interesting if you could tell us anything about that. Mm -hmm. Um, are we taking one question and then, or doing questions in bundles? Um, 
so there's only that question for the moment. So maybe answer that one and uh, and other Fantastic. people can um because sort of through mm. the questions on people so they can take a bit yeah. of time to think. Yeah. Some. Um great question. Um and it's really interesting and um, in some ways, I wish I knew more about it, um, and there might actually be some other people who have stuff they want to contribute. Um, so as part of my time there, we visited quite a lot of economic cooperatives, um, which are generally place-based. So some of them are quite small ones that have come out of a local commune. Um, other ones have been set up on a bigger level. Um, by the regional administration or district. Um, so there are a lot of cooperatives. Um, it's very much a budding cooperative economy though. Cooperatives are seen as sort of the vision of a really important part of a sort of anti-capitalist economy, so to speak. Um, I think it's important to recognize that there, a lot of them are really struggling. A lot of them are doing really well too, but you know, it's kind of like a slowly, slowly thing. And part of that is just the material challenges that they're faced with. Um, embargo invasion um the fact that the north the autonomous administration is not recognized as a political body by a lot of the international actors like the un because it's not a state um and the fact that it doesn't even try to be a state means that other you know bodies which might in some ways engage with them just don't even know what to do with them so a lot of aid and infrastructure funding is um funneled away from administration and instead goes directly to the Assad regime who then keeps it away from North and East Syria. Um, so a lot of this kind of like infrastructural resources that could really benefit a cooperative economy um, just never make it to North East Syria. That said, what the administration has accomplished is amazing. Um, so there are a lot of agricultural, um, agricultural cooperatives, things like tree nurseries, vegetable farms, seedling farms, gardens, um, as well as just like run of the mill sort of like food packaging plants, crisp factories, linen factories, soap factories, things like that. Some of them really small, like tailoring workshops, other ones actually quite big. Um, there's also, and they interact with the administration through the economy committees of the councils. So the cooperatives will then be engaged in the governance structures as well, and will then feed into um, all the different levels. There's also a bit of almost a cultural or a mindset shift that needs to happen. So some of the kind of self-criticisms that a lot of people in the administration and the economic works of the administration have made is that they've kind of implemented this system of, um, of a cooperative economy without really maybe providing enough education and culture shift about what it means to have a cooperative. So instead of having, um, for example, like an agricultural cooperative, which is truly democratic and sort of owned, run, and, and worked on by the people of an area, um, a group of people will pool their resources and then hire laborers to come in and do all the work and still call it a cooperative. And so that's kind of a big discussion that's been happening and the administration has realized, okay, there's a lot of things which are saying they're cooperatives, but are, are cooperatives only in name and not in practice. Um, so we're actually gonna start phasing those out, do a lot of education, and also um, do things like really make sure that cooperatives are tied to specific communes or neighborhoods in order to give them that, that more democratic, um, rooted in society um, structure instead of just being able, it's just a, it's just a different business. Um, so that's the kind of cooperative section of the economy, still quite small. Um, then there's the private economy um, that includes a lot of sort of small business owners, uh, shops, uh, taxis, things like that. Um, and then you also have a lot of smuggling and black market. And the administration, to an extent, just needs to allow that to happen because it brings goods um, into the region at a time that's actually difficult to bring goods into the region. Um, so there's the private economy, and then they also have unions and professional associations, which are channeled through Tevdem. Um, so that's how they feed into the political system. And then you have essentially the bigger sort of administration run economy. Um, so you have the bigger sort of like um, eco industrial projects, like there's some really interesting stuff in a lot of the economy um, committees on the higher level where they're going, okay, we really want to foster smaller grassroots cooperative economy, but what about the bigger stuff? How do we feed 4 million people? How do we become um, economically and kind of how do we achieve food sovereignty? How do we feed ourselves? 
how do we give people work and how do we do it as ecologically as possible. So actually quite a lot of the economy is also run um, by the administration itself. Um, and then it's also important to mention that there is, through all this as well, like a very strong gender element. So Aburiya Jin, um, which is women's economy, which is run by the um, economy committee of the women's section of the Atan administration in partnership with Congress Star, which is like the women's sort of civil society movement organization, um, create and support a lot of women's economic initiatives. Uh, provide a huge amount of sort of training and skill sharing between women, um, both just women who live in a commune, but also, for example, a lot of women who've escaped abusive marriages um, will then be specifically trained up to um, have a skill that they can enter a cooperative with, um, so supporting the, the women's economy in that as well. And similarly to why women are seen as the political leaders of the, of the movement, there's also an understanding that, again, because women have been marginalized by and dominated by capitalism, um, and that capitalism is actually intrinsically tied up with patriarchy, women are able to create new ways of working in terms of economy, which don't just replicate. So the idea isn't to integrate women into a capitalist economy, but to actually nurture a new kind of economy, which is led by women um, and of pretty much anti-capitalist, pro-democracy, pro-society, pro-liberation principles. Um, and then that necessarily needs to be ecological. There are a huge amount of challenges to um, creating a sort of, to make Rojava an ecological project. Like there's a lot of amazing work happening, but there's a lot of challenges as well. Um, we probably don't have time to go into all of them, but it's really amazing to see people really look at those economic questions and say, okay, on the one hand, um, we want to be really sustainable. And on the other hand, um, we're in a region that is you know, under embargo and under attack a lot of the time. How do we feed the 4 million people who live here? Um, and really seeing people juggle those questions, but, but always hold both of them. Um, and that's something that I wanted to mention today. I think one of those things that um, makes, that we should think about more here is how we can avoid this sort of binary thinking, which kind of thinks, well, you have to either choose one thing or another you know, this is either good or bad, but actually say, you know what, when we have to make really difficult choices, when we're talking about how we actually build community power and build our society structures up to a point where we actually hold and exercise power, we're going to have to make a lot of difficult decisions. So how are we able to hold both of those things which are important and work through the kind of like the, the gritty spots and the contradictions and the tensions? And I think that the, um, sort of ecology and um, survival tensions are, are really there in Rojava and it's really amazing to see that being navigated by the administration. Thanks, Fian. That was re yeah, really rich um, answer and uh, goes back to one of the questions uh, that I'd asked earlier about what makes this revolutionary because we have, there's a very fixed image of what a revolution looks like because of these traditions of the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, the mass expropriations that came along with it. And that, that didn't happen here. But um, when you look that in, in, in eight years now in Jazeera, uh, in, which is the northeast of northeast Syria, um, Aburiya Jin, the women's economy movement that you mentioned, uh, said last week to some friends who were working on a project with them together, that now 6% of Jazeera Canton's um, economy is women's uh, uh, is, is women's cooperatives. So it really shows how, how you can um, be both pragmatic and principled in a revolution and create really dramatic change, change that is ongoing, as, as you were saying. Um, but I think there's a friend here with the name S. Hunt um, who was going to ask a question. So I'm just going to unmute you now uh, and you can ask your question to Vianne. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Thanks, Vian. Very interesting so far. Um, just actually, my question is linked to probably the, the end of what you were, you were talking about, um, balancing difficult choices. And I was, uh, my, my question was around where there are points of disagreement. So if you've got um, a disagreement on an issue, is, is, it, uh, is it a simple majority? Is it, uh, do you carry on with consensus decision making until you thrash it out? 
would you have a super majority or other other mechanisms because i think we probably all um direct democracy and participatory democracy can mean slightly different things in terms of the particular constitution so that was the area i was interested in cool yeah i'm really glad you asked that because it's actually a really um interesting question so part of the the beauty and richness of democratic federalism is that the sort of decisions about how decisions are made are also devolved um, so you'll actually have different communes different assemblies different committees making decisions in different ways um, even running elections in different ways. I mean, elections are a really messy topic and we're not going to get too into it because it's just not actually that interesting to most people. But elections are run in different ways in different areas, um, partly just because of the sort of like material reality of the situation. So for example, like in Minbij, um, which is one of the regions, they didn't run elections in order to get the current um, people who are holding kind of committee positions in power because it was just after the area had been liberated from ISIS and it just wasn't the right time to have elections. Actually, you would have come up with a less democratic result if you just ran <clears throat> open ballots, um, as opposed to what they did do, which is that they went around to lots of different um, community groups, associations, um, community leaders, existing you know, organizations and structures and said, hey, who can you imagine on some kind of council in order to run this region? And that's how they created um, the, the council, which at some point is going to be re elected and they're trying to do it through elections. Um, but at the time, it just actually wouldn't have been more democratic to have elections. Um, and then in other places, they'll just decide to do things in a slightly different way. Like in, in some places, the way that they incorporate the municipality bodies into this sort of district is different than others. Because again, it just depends on the local circumstances and they get to decide. Um, so in terms of the actual decision-making processes, um, people do vote. Um, people also kind of do sort of informal consensus. I've never seen any of the kind of like formal consensus rules that we exercise often in kind of uh, UK left culture where we have the kind of like objections and direct points and the hand-waving and stuff. Like that's definitely not in the political culture there. Um, and it's it's more of a consensus in terms of, uh, you know, we're going to discuss these issues because we need to come to a solution and we need to come to a good solution. So we need to involve everybody in order to do that. Um, that said, I think that the, the people who participate in economic structures um, are so aware of the risks of what would happen if they fail to come to a decision and take action that you don't get the same situation where it's just like a complete like dead end of people who allegedly agree with each other. Um, I think it's also important to mention that there is like a lot of like uh, leadership. So people who are the co-chairs and the co-vice chairs do hold um, power. Dion, yeah, you somehow got muted there. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can okay, hear you. Okay, fantastic, so cool. The last that I heard was um, uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. is... So there is leadership and, and you don't kind of get the situation where like a whole group of people all try to thrash out the kind of like proposal or whatever together. Quite often there'll be a discussion, people will raise their points, people will raise their concerns. And then the co-chairs will go off and make a decision based on that. Um, but it's a leadership that's accountable, that's transparent, um, that's recallable, and that's open to criticism. And those um, mechanisms for giving feedback, evaluation, criticism are very embedded in the process. So um, you don't have to wait until the next round of elections or to tell somebody like, you, you shouldn't have done that. That wasn't in line with what we wanted you to do. But there definitely is a lot of trust and you know there it's running a, a essentially like a, a government structure right it's, it's running everything for four million people so you don't you don't have this kind of like um you know fairy tale idea of what the direct democracy looks like it does require delegation it does require trust and just saying okay i don't quite agree with that but i'm just gonna let it go 
Thanks. So we've got quite a few questions now. Um, I've got two from the chat uh, from from this call itself, and then there's one from the uh, from the Facebook that I'll that I'll ask myself as well. Um, so I'll go with the first one that I saw pop up. So this is a friend who has the username 7EVPM2. Um, and then I'll ask the question from the Facebook and then come to Margaret Gallagher. Um, so you should be unmuted now, so you should, can ask your question. Where are you? We can hear you now, so 7 EVPM2. So if uh, if you wanted to ask your question. Hello. Okay, I might, uh, maybe we can come back to the friend. Um, and since Margaret is here in the chat and uh, the friend wasn't there, Margaret, why don't you ask your question? I uh, just wanted to ask, um, the health service and the hospitals would probably already be under pressure. So how are they managing with the coronavirus pandemic? Can you say that, you that again? That yeah. About the health service, uh, the hospitals, how are they managing in the coronavirus pandemic? They were all probably already under a lot of pressure before that. Mm -hmm. How are they managing currently in the pandemic? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'll do my best to answer that. And it's mostly based on just, I'm still in touch with quite a lot of friends who are over there, um, including those working in the health sector. So I'll give a, a response on that. But I also know that um, there have been kind of more official um, communications about it. Um, essentially, like, yes, the hospitals are under pressure in general because a lot of the hospital capacity was destroyed during the most recent Turkish invasion in October um, last year. So, um, you know, you get to a point where, you know, North and East Syria, again, population of 4 million people, has something like 40 um, respirators and 35 sort of critical care beds. Um, so the capacity is tiny compared to what we have here. Um, there have been cases of coronavirus in um, North and East Syria, specifically in Hasake, which is one of the big urban centers um, in the east. Um, and that's been kind of like relationships with the Assad regime have really made it hard to um, effectively diagnose because in Rojava they don't have any testing capacity. So the tests have to get sent to the Assad regime in Damascus and they've actually been quite obstructive in sending the results back. So then you have like actually a period of two weeks where the virus can potentially be spreading. Um, so there was some quite a strict lockdown quarantine that came into place around the same time as um, the UK went into lockdown. Um, and then it became contained around Hasake where the cases emerged. And then since then it's mostly been dissolved when they're kind of, you know, seeing what's gonna happen. But I know that the administration is working on increasing health, um, health service capacity. And that's been something that once the coronavirus um, pa pandemic kind of came, showed up on the horizon, um, they started building more um, kind of critical care units, isolation wards and things like that. And they also, this is when the communes came into action in order to, when people were in lockdown, the communes were able to distribute food and gas and other essentials um, as well. And the administration organized a lot of disinfection and so on. Um, currently, it doesn't seem like there's an overwhelming number of cases. How that's going to play out is completely uncertain. Um, there is a Rojava Information Center report that came out in the last few weeks outlining the situation and some potential scenarios. Um, but another thing to flag up about the health system, um, which is mostly run by the autonomous administration, there's also some kind of private and some NGO run hospitals and health facilities as well. Um, it's also one of the sectors that's been really damaged by the fact that a lot of um, international humanitarian bodies don't deal directly with the North, with the autonomous administration because it's not a state. So again, all of that aid, for example, the World Health Organization, um, the United Nations, um, HCR, and um, I think the World Food Program, they all go through Damascus, which means that North and East Syria really gets excluded. So there's been times that, for example, the 
um, humanitarian bodies who are acting in North and East Syria actually have to put money into the private medical facilities because they're not allowed to give resources and put them into the autonomous administration run health facilities. So it's really, um, you know, both like a lack of access to short term humanitarian aid, but also something that down the road is going to be really damaging because this vital infrastructure that can be all essentially democratically owned and run through the administration is instead of being investing into that, it's investing into um, private hospitals, but actually quite a lot of NGOs for example, Médecins Sans Frontières, so Doctors Without Borders, have chosen to stop working with, the, with Damascus. And they just say, we, we're actually not going to work with the um, Assad regime anymore. And they work in North and East Syria instead. Thanks, Fian. So I think we can, we can go back to the other friend, who is um, Murat. Uh, and you can ask your question now. And then I'll, um, there's a few questions that have come up on the Facebook live stream as well. So once... Uh, Murat has asked, I'll ask those. So, you should be uh, ask now. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I apologize for the inconvenience. I was confused with my <laughs> automatic ID name. Uh, uh, I have, uh, in fact, two questions regarding the ecological aspect of uh, this uh, sort of reorganizing society in Rojava. First one is uh, related to agriculture. To what extent the revolution there uh, uh, has informed the monoculture there? Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, uh, is monoculture so popular in Rojava? In fact, I don't know about that. And then if it is the case, how the revolution kind of trying to to rebuild the, 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 the agriculture system based on non-monoculture uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, in fact, this is the, uh, the first question. And the second one is related to the oil extraction. Uh, how it is, in, it is dealt with in Rojava? How you know, the, the, the process of oil uh, uh, extraction for now or for future is kind of organized based on the ecological concern? Thank you so much. Thank you for those questions. Um, really, yeah, really fascinating issue and one that's full of, yeah, contradictions and, and beautiful ideas and, you know, devastating realities and limitations. Um, so as many of you probably know, um, the Assad regime and the Ba'athist regime imposed a monocultural um, agricultural system on North and East Syria because in general it's quite a sort of bread basket region that has really good agricultural soil. Um, it was made to produce a huge amount of wheat, cotton and some barley um, and actually transferred from more traditional and sustainable techniques into this monoculture in order to then feed the economy of the regime. Um, so all the sweets and cotton and barley was then being sent to the regime for processing. Um, and to a large extent, this is still the case. Um, you know, wheat and cotton, I mean, they, they are the cash crops. Um, and they are also something that the economy really relies on and that people really rely on as well. Um, and the administration, the revolution movement is trying really hard to do a lot of um, education a lot of research and again setting up like these cooperatives which are a lot more around kind of polyculture and more sustainable methods as well as setting up um sort of embedding that ecological approach into a community basis so not just kind of seeing it as something that's really separate like ecology happens over here but choosing certain places where these um different approaches can be trialed in a way that's really incorporated into community life so two examples are Jinwar, which is the women's village that a lot of people have heard about, which is a women's village um, for women and their children who um, come to live together democratically and freely. And as part of that project, um, they run a cooperative village economy, um, which includes some um, harvesting lentils, chickpeas, uh, wheat, but also like a vegetable patch, also like um, goats and sheep. Um, and and so they kind of incorporate and then they manage it collectively. Everybody who lives in the village takes part in that. Um, and then they receive their kind of monthly income from the cooperative village economy. So again, they've really embedded into that project. 
Um, and that, that was kind of like a built from, from scratch kind of project. So in some ways it's almost easier because you can kind of, the people self-select into it. Um, another example is the village of Jarudi, which is outside the town of Derek, the city of Derek, which we would visit quite a lot um, because it was, there was a guy there who was just so passionate about ecology and community and education and internationalism that he would always invite us over when they were doing, um, you know, harvesting or having like big um, celebrations and so on. And so this is an already existing village where they've been trying to bring in more of an ecological aspect and they set up um, like a community garden um, and they've started having a few fields that are grown and worked and sort of sold and processed um, cooperatively by the village. So everybody in the village comes in, they get to decide what they're gonna grow in those fields. Um, they help with the harvest and with the processing and then they're able to share in the harvest either through the finished product or through the income if they sell it. Um, but it's a really difficult process because a lot of people just aren't interested in doing that. They've got their other work, they got their other ideas of what they want to be doing with their time. Um, so it's a big question of social organizing, of community organizing. And I think the movement's really aware that it's many, many years of work in order to actually incorporate ecology into people's lives. And often you have to start in a place where people are more quickly kind of agree with. So for example, in Jarudi, um, something they start off with was litter picking and they said we have a beautiful village um, why is there trash in the streets so they started organizing collective litter picks and then you know they built up to the community garden and they built up to the collective cooperative field and now they've built a big community center and it's kind of about this like really slowly slowly bringing people in long-term vision um, kind of way so um, and it, there's also the kind of interesting thing where again avoiding the binary thinking in terms of strategy the movement has really invested in some small areas which would kind of like pilot or try out new things and really go very deep in the practice of kind of having an ecological approach, a sustainable approach, while at the same time also having this overarching um, approach as well, which sometimes, which means that you have these pockets of like amazing practice and then a general layer of growing awareness. And I think that combination is really important. And also when we think about organizing in the UK, when we're thinking, okay, are we organizing nationally or locally? Are we community organizing or building something really big? It's actually figuring out how we can do that both. How, how can we create these pockets of deep practice, connect them together, and then distribute them around like the whole area in order for us to kind of learn from each other and draw strength from each other and kind of bring everybody um, along on the journey together. Um, the question around oil extraction is also really interesting because, you know, how can a revolutionary movement, which one of its like main pillars is ecological sustainability, how can they um, have oil extraction as one of their sort of main economic activities? And it is, as people in the movement say, a contradiction, like it's not perfect. Um, there is still oil extraction happening in mostly Rimelon and Derazor. Um, it is a major source of income for the, um, for the administration and it's also a huge part of um, people's lives. They're, they're used to having cheap diesel that they use to heat the houses, run the generators, um, do all sorts of kind of basic, basic things. Um, and there are, you know, there is an increasing amount of sort of solar panels um, coming in of passive water heating, things like that, um, trying to get the, um, the dams that are already built, trying to get them working at full capacity. Um, and the interesting thing as well is that in the, um, in like the university body for people who are studying fossil fuel and energy in Rimelon, part of the curriculum of people who are going into fossil fuel extraction is about sustainability. It's really understanding what's the impact of fossil fuels and how do we do it in as sustainable way as possible? How do we transition out of it? So even though the uh, movement at this time is saying, right now we can't quite survive without our oil extraction, they're still putting into place the stuff for the future to, to transition out of it. And also like um, there's a, amazing agricultural research centers where they're taking samples of soil everywhere and really analyzing it, trying out different seeds in different places, trying to have the kind of information and, um, and test run ready so that as things get picked up more and more, as they're able to either because of capacity or economy or because there's finally enough peacetime 
to do these kinds of projects, they have the information already at their disposal to say, try growing these crops. These ones work really well in this climate. These ones might work really well, you know, in your region. Um, so I think that ability to balance short-term action, but also that long-term perspective is quite interesting. Thanks so much, Vianne. So we, we've got uh, four, sort of four and a half um, questions that, uh, that have come to us either through the Facebook chat or in the chat here, which I'll ask shortly. And I think this, this will be the last round of questions. Um, so if people are quick enough to get their hands up or, or ask a question um, now, uh, then, then we can include them. Otherwise, after these questions, we'll I've got a couple of summing up questions. Um, and then we've got some uh, some shout outs as well for uh, different campaigns going on at the moment. Um, but before we come to that, so on the Facebook, uh, Irina Shokenko uh, asked, firstly, is this strategy, the model in Rojava, a proposal which is socially accepted uh, by the rest of the Kurdish territories? So I guess in Turkish, Iraqi, um, in Iranian Kurdistan, uh, and, and I think connected to this, Mohammed Chakri on the um, Facebook also asked about the relationship between the KRG and uh, the autonomous administration, particularly with these issues about uh, medical assistance, whether, whether that can come through the KRG rather than, rather than from the Assad regime. So those are two questions about the relationship to other parts of Kurdistan. Then Arina also asked, uh, on Rojava, on northeast Syria in particular, what the idea is on taxation and how to manage common welfare related to money and these sorts of things. Um, also on the Facebook, Ulisse uh, Pitsi asked uh, an interesting question, which, uh, apart from the Turkish invasion and the threat of the Turkish state, uh, and I guess also the the other external things like the relationship with the Assad regime, things like that. What are the inner contradictions, you would say, of this revolutionary system? Um, and just, just finally, uh, Paul in the chat uh, also asked, um, in light of the Turkish invasion at the end of at the end of last year, and the need for the Syrian Democratic Forces, for the Syrian Democratic Council and the Autonomous Administration led by Ilhan Ahmed um, to, the, on the, because of their need to enter into an agreement with the Assad regime, out of survival obviously, how is this hampering the possibility of the model that Bian's outlined, that you've outlined, how is it limiting the possibility of that de developing further? Um, and particularly, Paul was asking about the genealogy component, the women-led decision-making, the women-led courts, uh, also Yekajen, and the other um, uh, structures where the women's movement is leading. So I think, let me just make sure I haven't missed anyone. Yeah, those will be the last questions. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's a lot of questions, a lot of ground, and there's definitely going to be some areas I'm less knowledgeable about, um, but I'll do my best with the knowledge I have. And I see that I think it's Joe is signposting to lots of resources um, in the chat as well. So please do check those out too. Um, so first, just a quick response to the question of like the KRG and whether humanitarian aid can enter through the KRG. Um, so this is kind of where we get into like kind of really sort of boring technical international law stuff around kind of like how humanitarian aid is distributed in different areas but essentially um in kind of one nation state because the united nations and a lot of other humanitarian actors are focused on a nation state framework um they can say for example there's all you can only have one registered office of um, United Nations, HRC, or of an international NGO, or for example, the International Committee for the Red Cross. So there's only one official Red Cross in all of Northeast Syria. Um, Heva Sor, Kurdish Red Crescent, um, technically isn't like acknowledged as a legitimate Red Cross actor because it's not the Syrian Arab Red Crescent which is the Assad-backed um, Red Cross, because that's the official one. Um, so there's kind of all sorts of sort of technicalities around that, but um, essentially what a lot of NGOs who do want to work with North and East Syria do is that they set up regional offices and they operate as cross-border NGOs still have an office in KRG um, 
such as the Kurdish regional government of Iraq or in Jordan or in Egypt or just sort of in all in any place where they can then send people in uh, to do the work in North and East Syria, but then they're actually not officially registered in Syria. They're acting cross-border. So it's kind of one of those technicalities which highlights that the limitations of um, a humanitarian system and a global governance system which is based on nation states such as the UN. I think we need to be really aware of that, that um, it's, it's a framework that's wrong. And even though we can try to get the United Nations to kind of work more directly with the North um, the Autonomous Administration, and they do through these kind of like backwards, like behind the scenes kind of like ways, um, but actually it's the system that needs to change. It's not just about creating essentially loopholes for um, places like North and East Syria. Like that should be the norm that regions which are governing themselves should be able to access humanitarian aid when they're being um, attacked from you know various sides. Um, humanitarian aid does get sent in from KRG, um, and this relates to the question around whether the democratic federalism proposal is accepted across all of Kurdistan. There, you know, when um, when Turkey attacked in October, um, you know, we met a lot of um, volunteers coming in from KRG, from the the Kurdish region of Iraq, who are coming to join um, the Syrian Democratic Forces in order to defend Rojava against Turkish attack, even though the KRG government. Um, which is led by the Barzani clan um, and represents a very different kind of proposal, like a very capitalist, a very nationalist, a very sort of like pro-neoliberal side, um, is actually working more closely with Turkey than they do with the administration. Um, so there are definitely tensions across Kurdistan um, and it's not uniform. You know, in, in Baku or in, um, in the Kurdish region of Turkey, there's a very strong democratic and federalist movement that's been incredibly um, oppressed and marginalized by the Turkish state, which has really shown its, its fascist colors, essentially by how hard they've cracked down on democratic and federalist organizing um, in, in the Turkish region of, in, sorry, in the Kurdish region of Turkey in Bakur, um, where upwards of 10,000 know, teachers, community organizers, mayors, democratically elected representatives are all in jail because they were participating in a democratic and federalist project. Um, so it really varies um, in every region of Kurdistan. There are multiple political tendencies present. And in, within Rojava, within Northeast Syria, there's also multiple tendencies present. And the um, more sort of Barzani-influenced political parties organized under ENKS. Um, there was some news recently that came out that I unfortunately don't have details of where there actually has finally been more, uh, some kind of agreement, a breakthrough between those political parties who've been mostly boycotting the political projects in North and East Syria, and um, the PYD, which is one of the main political parties who've been promoting the democratic and federalist. And maybe um, Nick or, or Sarah, if one of you knows more about it, you can chip in. Um, but there definitely are multiple tendencies, and the democratic and federalist project aims to be able to incorporate all the different voices as much as possible, like all these political parties have been invited to sit around the table in the Syrian Democratic Council, um, but many of them have chosen not to. Um, the question about taxation, um, I'm going to say I wish I knew more about that, but um, I don't really know the specifics of taxation. Um, but yeah, if anybody does, please sign post resources in the chat. One thing I will say is that um, between the different regions, resources are distributed. So for example, the regions that have a lot of fossil fuels and therefore have that kind of um, cash income through them, that's redistributed throughout the region. So even though regions have a certain degree of autonomy over their own economies and resources, if it gets to the point where, for example, one region would then become really wealthy and another one wouldn't because of how the global economic system works, then that's redistributed through the councils, now be through the democratic councils of the autonomous administration, which includes representatives from all of the different um, bodies in each region. So then that's decided democratically and they need to reach some kind of decision on that. Oh, and there's more questions. Um, what are the threats and challenges and inner contradictions? Um, so outside of the threats. So I guess partly it's the different, um, there's the political tensions of the kind of political constituencies who disagree with the democratic and federalist project. Um, I was, one thing I was really amazed by is um, how much patience uh, a lot of the kind of 
really dedicated organizers in Rojava have um, when they're working with people who really disagree um, with where they're coming from. And that includes both the people who disagree and refuse to participate or the ones who are participating um, but are actually coming from very different perspectives. So for example, a lot of the more um, conservative Arab tribes in some of the southern regions um, come in with, you know, polygamy being kind of a standard practice, um, refusing to uh, have a female co-chair in their committees and their assemblies um, and coming from a really different perspective and often having quite an undemocratic, um, you know, they, they're not running a, an assembly for their district or for their neighborhood. They're just kind of making decisions <clears throat> in the same way as they would have before, but kind of feeding into the democratic and federal system. So it's a really interesting tension between um, at what point do you say, um, <clears throat> sorry, at what point do you say, well, that's, that's too far from our f foundational principles of women's liberation, sustainability, and grassroots democracy? And what point do you say, hey, it's better to have you on board and to include you, and therefore in the long term to work towards democratic future together, um, as opposed to saying, oh, that's too far, we can't include you. And that's the kind of like really big decisions which are being juggled all the time. Um, and in general, I've seen the movement come down on the side of this is a project for everyone. This is a project for all of society. And if we start picking and choosing, no, you can't send your representative to the assembly, um, then we're actually undermining. Um, and there's a really strong understanding that these things need to be, need to come from below. They need to take, take root on the ground and they can't be imposed. From above otherwise they're just replicating the same dynamics as the Assad regime so when it comes to laws like really deep questions around for example like women's rights women's liberation um, the women the women's organizers the women's movement organizers say we want to go in there and say okay no more polygamy you can't do that you can't do that but they know that that's not an effective political strategy so instead they grit their teeth, they smile and they go in there and they talk to the women and they set up academies and they support the women who do kind of come to them and try to organize with them. Um, so although I do think that um, kind of inner political tension and conflict and people with different visions is, a, a, I guess, a challenge or a contradiction that the administration is working with, um, I'm actually incredibly hopeful that they have the political culture and practices and um, determination and commitment and just that kind of strength of belief of what they're working for and the understanding of where they're heading that makes them um, strong enough to be able to work with people who they really disagree with and say hey it's more important that you're here sitting around the table with us than, than that you're not we'd rather have you in the room than out of the room so that's a really amazing probably one of the most um, important things I learned while I was over there to really see how people can hold their beliefs um, while still kind of walking alongside people who they disagree with. Um, and so other inner contradictions are, I mean, even, so the standard of living, um, even though pretty much everybody has the basic needs met because the communes, um, this is important, in addition to being these kind of like hubs of local democracy, they also have like material roles in distributing subsidized bread in distributing subsidized gas so people can heat their houses and cook their food. Um, if you want like certain kinds of like permits, permissions, registrations, things like that, you usually go through your communes. So they have a very sort of tangible impact on people's lives. Um, but regardless, like even, even though like they are part of people's lives, a lot of people just don't engage in them. It's a change of mentality that people after decades and decades of being told your opinion doesn't matter. You are kind of some a, a subject that the state enacts itself upon, that you, you don't have kind of political agency. People need to learn. They need to relearn democracy. They need to relearn a political culture, um, which they put themselves at the center of as, as an agent, as somebody who can actually do something and get involved in. So instead of going, where's my gas? Where's my bread? Where's my permit? They go, okay, well, let's Let's take full advantage. How can I be involved in this? How can I make my commune, my neighborhood, my district a better place to live? Um, so that's a huge, um, a huge project that the movement has ahead of it. And there's been a lot of um, self kind of critical evaluation from the movement where they, they kind of at some point about, I guess it was about a year and a half ago now, they were just like, the communes, they're not really working. Not all of them. 
Some of them are. Some of them are amazing. A lot of them are okay, but some of them are just replicating that kind of state dynamic of people sort of acting as consumers um, and not actually participating in a democracy. Um, and the co-chairs replicating that um, that relationship of like, well, we're in charge. Um, and the movement reflected and said, we didn't do enough education. We didn't go out there and really talk to people about what does a commune mean? How is it different from what was before? What do we need from you? How do we make you feel empowered in this system? Um, so they were starting to plan a whole series of like meetings and conferences in order to bring people together um, to really get people to engage in the system um, in a more proactive democratic way. Um, unfortunately, just as all those meetings were meant to happen, um, there was the Turkish invasion was launched um, last October. So that was, you know, put on hold. And there's so many instances like that where um, there's, there's inner contradictions and inner weaknesses and challenges, which the movement is trying to address, but then can't address because it doesn't have the capacity or, you know, just the, the space to breathe in order to do it. Um, the movement has a really amazing capacity of evaluating, um, self-criticizing, taking on board feedback, and then readjusting the course. You know, I've seen military commanders sit down and talk really openly about in the invasion of Afrin, this is something we did wrong and we shouldn't have done that. And next time we're going to do something different. Um, and just the, the humility and the strength to be able to do that, to put yourself in that vulnerable position, say we did something wrong and it, it maybe cost lives or it cost the loss of territory, but it's more important that we admit that mistake so we can grow and learn from it than to hide it in order to look like we're infallible. Um, it's really quite amazing. So I have a lot of faith in the movement's ability to adjust its course and to deal with those inner conflicts, um, but they need to be given the support and the resources and the space to do so. Um, another one of those problems is the fact that a lot of young people do want to leave you know, North East Syria. They do want to go, come to Europe or come to Iraq or even Turkey and kind of try to make money that they've kind of bought into this more kind of capitalist approach and um, don't see themselves as having enough opportunities in North East Syria. Um, and that's also a really difficult one because, you know, for me, like, you know, who am I to say, oh, no, you should stay here because, you know, I'm there as a visitor to learn and then I'll go back to where I'm from. Um, but it's, it's really, it's really a very interesting dynamic of kind of seeing people who kind of say, I want to get out of here. And how can you disagree with that? You know, like, there's a lot of death. There's a lot of challenges, like life is harder. And um, but it's also a really, you know, I, I would, I would, you know, I would love to go back there because there is something of being in a place which is a liberated territory, which feeds your soul in a way that neoliberal capitalism just doesn't do. Um, but at the same time, you also have people, you know, Kurdish diaspora people all over the world coming to Rojava and saying, yes, I know that, you know, the standard of life is lower, that the risk of that is higher, that the challenges are more extreme, but like it's a place I want to be and I want to stand with that project and that's a really inspiring thing to see as well. And finally, do I have time to do the final question of um, the sort of agreement with the regime? Yeah, sure. That's so, so Sarah um, uh, is using host privileges. There's one extra uh, question. Um, uh, but yeah, the brief answers to this. We have, we have a bit of time. Um, and then we'll do the summing questions before the end. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, it's like quite a you know quick answer in that, as far as I'm aware, um, that you know the agreement that was made with the regime, you know, at the time in in October, that was like a military agreement, and all the sort of like political details hadn't been thrashed out yet. As far as I'm aware, those talks, those kind of political talks about well, what does it mean? Who gets to hold? You know, this responsibility, that authority, they're still ongoing. Um, so how much is going to hamper it? Like, I mean, with the, with the Turkish invasion, you know, like the administration was very much put on the back foot. So they've, they've always been open to negotiation with the Assad regime, but when they were in a position where they said, well, we're getting invaded right now, we could, we could really use some extra military power. They were then in a much weaker position for bargaining than they were before, um, which was really heartbreaking to see 
you know, kind of feeling like how much will they lose at the negotiating table because of this. Um, there is the reality that the Assad regime is in many ways very weak, that the army is, you know, the husk of an army that's just being sort of held up by Russia. Um, but then at the same time, you know, Rojava is between a rock and a hard place and another hard place with, you know, Turkey, the Assad regime and the fairly hostile KRG Barzani regime on the other. Um, so in some ways, it's amazing that they've held out this long and achieved so much in this amount of time. Um, but in some ways, like, I'm going to turn that question back around and say, like, well, what are we going to do to give them, like, the resources and power and support from it internationally to make sure that they are able to, like, hold more space at the negotiating table? Um, it's not something that's just, like, something that we just passively observe. We're all political actors here. We're all here because we care about it and because we're finding what's happening in North and East Syria incredibly inspiring and something we want to stand by. Um, so that's kind of you know, what comes to the shout outs at the end of the different campaigns and actions that are happening. Um, but that's really something that we have influence over and something, you know, when I was, um, when I was in Rojava in October and Turkey was invading and we were kind of watching all of these sort of like de empty declarations of support or condemnation of the invasion coming from all of our different governments around the world, um, followed up by virtually zero action what I felt was um, a sense of failure in my social movements back home, that we hadn't built up the level of power and, and militants to be able to call our government to account and say, no, you need to actually remove all you know, the, the permits for the weapons you're selling to the Turkish state. You, know, you need to like, act more strongly. And I think for me, like, I really felt shame that all across the world, we weren't able to put a stop to this invasion from where it was being funded, from where the weapons were being you know, sold from, where they're being manu manufactured. Um, and I think that's something that we would need to think about. How do we build up a movement that can support the administration to continue fighting for women's liberation and democracy and ecology in North and East Syria? That was a really powerful answer. Thank you. Um, so, Sarah, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you about land ownership and I mean, I know that quite a lot of land had previously been nationalized, but obviously it's really important in anything that we expect to be anti-capitalist, who does own the land and, and what sort of private property relations there are. So I wondered if you could say anything about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Um, so in some ways, uh, the administration um, was in a fairly, I guess, lucky situation in that when the regime was uh, pushed out of the um, original region, so Afrin, Kobani and Jazeera in 2012, um, when the regime was kicked out, they left behind a lot of land that had been under regime ownership. So even though there are some bigger landlords um, in in the regions, in the area, um, the administration never actually took land away from landlords um, who were still kind of around on some level because there was just such a surplus of land from the regime. So for example, um, the, the tree cooperative, the tree nursery cooperative we used to go to to kind of help out, to take cuttings, to buy saplings from, um, they, were on, they were on formal regime land and they had acres and acres of land. Um, that they were able to um, use to transform into a tree nursery. Um, some of the kind of like women's institutes um, are in former regime bases. Um, there's a whole area in one of the cities where lots of the kind of official offices are held. That used to be like a regime quarter. Um, and so actually with this kind of land and buildings and resources, um, the autonomous administration and the movement were able to say, okay, well, this is the space we're gonna use. Um, that said, there is a political critique of, um, of mass land, private land ownership, and in some situations, the landlords are quite exploitative, um, and they really push down the people who work the land and get rich off the backs of um, exploitation. Um, and there were some instances in which the people working the land organized, and with the sort of like quiet go-ahead of the administration, were able to then like kick out the landlord 
and say, this is our land, we're working it, we've been working it for however long, and you're just sitting there and like making loads of money off of it. Um, we'll have it back, please, thank you. And because they knew that they had the political backing of administration, um, they felt strong in being able to do that. Um, that said, there's lots of situations in which there's landlords who are being really exploitative, but the people aren't organizing to overthrow them. And the stance of the administration, um, or at least the kind of officials and people I've spoken to, has been, um, we're, we will let them know that we would support them if they wanted to reclaim, reappropriate this land. Um, but until the initiative comes from them, we're not going to do it because otherwise we're going to encourage them, go on, go on, kick out your landlord. And then suddenly it's like, we're the new landlord. Um, and they haven't got the kind of like social cohesion, political power um, in order to administrate it in a democratic way. Or, or someone else just emerges as, as a new landlord. So again, it's that kind of long term perspective. And, and they were quite lucky in having a lot of regime land that they could take over instead. So it never actually got to the point where they, um, I mean, of course, they have, you know, alienated, the movement will have alienated a lot of the kind of like more sort of upper class, um, richer sort of landowners or property owners, but never at the point of like, people feeling like their livelihoods are being threatened um, by the presence of the administration. Thanks, and thank you so much. That was uh, 50 minutes of question, uh, um, questions and answers, so um, that was really great, thank you. Um, so uh, for the end then, we thought, um, as you said at the beginning, the Kurdistan Solidarity Network we exist first and foremost to uh, start building movements for practical solidarity with the Kurdish freedom movement and the Rojava revolution. But also we see ourselves as trying to learn from the practices of this movement and start to translate them so we can adopt and adapt these practices uh, and political culture in our own situation in these islands. So I thought that uh, we thought that for the end, it would be important to have some questions that brought out some of these issues um, a bit more. Uh, and I thought straight for the, from the get go, um, first question, just broad and easy, what struck you as really different from the political system in the United Kingdom? And do you think that we can start to transfer this system? So I guess a few things that were really different. So one, there's the kind of like non-binary thinking. Um, and in some ways I'm comparing the, the movement and administration in Rojava to the kind of broad left social movements we have in the UK. Um, I'm not gonna compare so much with the UK state because it's kind of comparing like apples to oranges or whatever the expression is. Um, so in general, there was that kind of ability to hold contradictions, to kind of have this non-binary approach to thinking and analysis where they kind of say, um, acknowledging that something isn't perfect, but still going for it without losing sight of the bigger picture and really being able to work through contradictions and actually celebrate those contradictions to really say contradictions are good because it shows you where the conflict is. It shows you where you're gonna like have to struggle, where you have to put more energy and focus. Um, so that kind of celebration of when things get difficult um, was a really amazing and, and really um, eventually refreshing um, approach to political um, organizing. I think also what really struck me as very different was um, the kind of culture and political practice. Um, there were kind of a lot of focus on education, and then really rooting everything into a wider ideological framework. I think, um, you know, the, the democratic and federalist movement, even though it is in many ways like homegrown in North and East Syria, is very much taken on the ideological um, heritage of um, Abdullah Öcalan and the writings around democratic and federalism and democratic nation, um, and was really influenced by the fact that Abdullah Öcalan and many other leadership of the Kurdistan Workers' Party were based in Syria from the 70s. Um, so there is this kind of common buy-in across the movement to the ideological framework. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't disagreements about how we apply it, how we interpret it, what we prioritize, but there was this kind of like concerted effort 
through like conversation and through a huge amount of education like just really deep like I mean I think I spent in total probably like three months of my time there doing educational courses where like stuff is really broken down and examined and explained um, and that is nothing compared to the level of education a lot of other people kind of enter into if they're for example being trained to do like diplomacy work or to be yeah kind of um, one of the community organizers or so on. Um, so really kind of having that political ideology that coheres people, but also a political culture, which is incredibly um, inclusive, um, which has space for conflict and tension while still maintaining that we are stronger together. Um, and I feel, at least in my personal experience of organizing in the UK, like I haven't really felt that kind of sense of like, however much we disagree, because we have this like common political understanding, we know that who our actual enemy is, like we know what we're up against. So therefore, we're, we're really going to say, however much we disagree, we're going to try our hardest to keep on fighting together, because there's no way that we can do it without each other. And that absolute commitment to the collective. Part of it comes from just the general culture, like um, individualism has really gone deep in, in the West, um, in like neoliberal states like the UK. So I think for me, like I didn't even realize how much my life was framed by like an individualist approach until I went to Rojava and really experienced what it felt like to be part of a really collective political movement. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't exist in the UK. There's huge instances of like when people really band together and develop something collective. Um, but it's a very, it's a very different shift of, of political culture and general sort of social culture um, that makes it really different. Um, and finally, the ability to think big, to really think, you know, in some ways you could say, well, they've already accomplished what a lot of people was in, thought was impossible. So like, what's the next impossible thing to them? But really like, um, it was probably the first time I sat around with a bunch of people who said, so um, global democratic confederalism, how are we gonna get there? You know, and really thinking in these huge terms um, while still kind of coping with the day-to-day -day stuff, as I mentioned before, um, but having the, the courage and the, I'm gonna say ambition and the political clarity to really know what's necessary and to really take it seriously and take themselves seriously and say, you know what, we are revolutionaries and we are connected to social movements all around the world. And it's our responsibility to like carry our, our burden, our there is a privilege to carry that load of um, how do we, as people in North and East Syria, contribute towards the project of global democratic federalism because it's not enough to have it here. We need to have it everywhere for it to be sustainable everywhere. Um, so that was incredibly inspiring and strengthening. And I think that we could do with a little bit more um, of, of big picture thinking in the UK. Thanks. And so, so then I think one of the things that's really come out in this, in this meeting, um, and certainly something that we feel is really important for, uh, for building practical solidarity is knowing knowing just how um, how beautiful and different uh, and and dynamic and how much potential there is in this movement and particularly in the revolution in in northern east syria and also knowing that it's not perfect it's not utopia now right it's it's the, there are there are challenges there are things that don't work so well um, and there are there are questions that need to be overcome and worked through so what would you say are the main challenges? What doesn't work so well in the system currently? Mm -hmm. I think we, um, we probably touched on a lot of these. Um, so there's obviously the kind of like wider like security defense situations as well as the economic challenges. Um, and there's also the challenges of not being able to access that kind of international humanitarian aid or access to political voice, you know, like, um, the administration of North and East Syria is excluded from the um, Geneva talks on the Syrian constitution. Um, and I think that's a, a huge challenge and that's really because of the, the paradigm that the rest of the world is operating in. Um, and then as I mentioned, the, the communes need to really 
come deeper. Um, when communes were first envisioned, they tried to set them up so that it was something like between one and 200 people, but instead it became usually closer to 150 families. Um, and in some of the biggest communes, it's over 2,000 people. And that's just, um, it's kind of too big to function properly as a more direct democracy kind of element. Um, because that, that's where the direct democracy resides. There's no assembly or council at the commune level. Um, you start getting councils at the neighborhood and sub-district level, but in the commune, it's meant to be direct and direct democracy with 2,000 people um, is really, really difficult because so much of the political culture relies on going around to people's houses and literally saying, hey, there's a meeting. Do you want to come? What do you think about this? Um, you should really get involved in this. Um, do you want to go to an education? Are you getting the kind of bread and gas and things that you're entitled to and so on? So, um, and that's just really hard to do and it's, it's a capacity issue, um, right? So the, the communes are a big challenge that if they really want to create a different, a fundamentally different kinds of politics as opposed to like a governance structure, which is a government and everything but name with a slightly more kind of humanitarian, socialist, you know, federated system, they really need to kind of shift, shift the communes. Um, and I think, yeah, that's a really big one. And, and then the, it's a mentality issue because it's the same with the kind of shifting to a more cooperative economy. Um, it's, um, it's, it's challenging when people still think in terms of a more capitalist, profit-orientated approach, a more state-orientated approach. So I think those are kind of all of the internal challenges. And so finally then, um, the sort of final mission statement that KSN has to start thinking about how we can adapt and apply uh, these um, ideas to, to the UK. We already spoke a bit about, about how we could change our social movements, but how is democratic confederalism as a structure adaptable to the United Kingdom and to, the, mm -hmm. to these islands, really? Yeah, I think... Um you know, like democratic confederalism isn't a, a blueprint, right? It's a series of principles and practices. So in many ways, like it's up to all of us to start having those conversations of what can it look like here? I think we could um, learn a lot from, you know, the experiences of Wales and Scotland and looking at how that's affected kind of more local organizing and sense of identity um, in, in those countries. Um, and how we can kind of like shift our relationships to really, yeah, reconceptualize what you know, how we confederate, like what our different regions are and so on. Um, and I think it's just really li like, like the kind of, um, like Wales and Scotland, really identifying where in the UK do we have instances of, of local power, of community power, and whether it's in like local democracy initiatives or community centers and youth centers, which really include the local community and create a strong network um, of people who feel ownership of, of their place and of their kind of like sense of themselves as a community. Um, I think that's really important. We need to identify those places where it's strongest, um, engage, build up, link together, and then also do the thing where we confederate that into a bigger picture. Um, so not just leaving these things of local initiatives in different places, but really bringing them together so we have this big picture. Because I think it's really important to remember that the that the communes don't kind of exist in the absence of like a, a bigger picture. Like the reason why the communes and the confederal system works is because the whole system is geared towards that unit, that political unit. And it's not that it's meaningless um, if we just do that in the UK when the state doesn't isn't supporting it, but it's its own series of unique challenges. It's a lot more of a confrontational approach i guess in some way so you know in rojava like the communes are supported and nurtured and and held by the administration um you know the autonomous administration was created in 2018 specifically to do the political task of building up the confederal system to build up the communes um whereas if you look more in the example of bakur in the kurdish region of turkey that also had a more confrontational relationship with the state because the Turkish state didn't want to devolve power. Um, so I think we need to be looking at this kind of like with one hand, like we build up our community power, our local democracy, and with the other, we kind of like push against the state 
um, and then like with our brains, we're thinking about the big picture and we're generating like ideas and narratives and stories about what we're actually trying to accomplish so we can bring people in. So it's a bit of a juggling act, but I think we just need to keep all of those elements in mind and not just put all of our resources into one of them. Um, so for example, there can be some engagement with electoral politics. Like I think, you know, getting people elected, especially to local government can be a really important political tactic but it can't exist separate from a, a broad base, deeply rooted and, and militant social movement and democratic community power. Um, so we can't do one without the other. And we often have to start with the building up community power instead of electing someone into a position and expecting that to somehow generate a social movement. So yes, I think balancing sort of that anti-state perspective or state engagement perspective, building up community power, I'm really thinking about how we're transforming the ideas, the, the lens through which we're seeing our world and what we're trying to accomplish. On that note, thank you so much, Fian. That was a really, really rich talk um, and really uh, thought-provoking and powerful answers. Um, so thank you. Uh, and we hope that uh, this has made you interested to find out more about democratic confederalism, but also the broader uh, political paradigm of the Kurdish freedom movement. Um, and if you are interested, then we have this uh, education series, which is running at the moment. Um, and uh, here you can see it began yesterday with the question, is a revolutionary approach to pol politics in Britain possible? Um, you can find that on our Facebook page of the Kurdistan Solidarity Network, and you can rewatch that. Also watch out um, on uh, Twitter at Kurdistan Solnet um, uh, and on Facebook soon we'll, we'll announce it uh, on the website as a downloadable podcast. And then next Monday we'll talk more about what democracy looks like without a state. On the 1st of June, talk about the leading role of women uh, in the revolution in Rojava, uh, connecting personal change and system change on the 8th of June, and then what's next for social movements uh, in these islands uh, for the last session on the 15th of June. So we hope to um, have lots of you join us then, um, but those will also be podcasted and Facebook Live, as I said. Um, also in this meeting, we've had lots of discussion about practical support for, uh, for Rojava and for the Kurdish freedom movement, um, and in particular trying to help overcome um, some of these external limitations uh, that are imposed on the, on the administration and, and Bian's answer before about the importance of us being able to help um, uh, uh, the autonomous administration overcome some of these more objective uh, uh, problems. So at, on Saturday, a new campaign was launched called uh, Water for Rojava. Um, which I will put the, let me just find it in this, sorry, in the, all the different screens that I've got open at the moment. Um, so I will show you the website for that now and hand over to Joe, who is an organizer of this campaign. Oh, hi, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so yeah, as Nick said, it's a, a campaign called Water for Rojava. Um, the kind of background for why um, we think this is such an important project at the moment is that essentially in an already desertifying region that's very much affected by climate change, in the time of a global pandemic, water is being used as a weapon of war, um, water infrastructure and, and also electric infrastructure, which are often the same, right, because there's a lot of hydropower in the region, are being targeted, attacked, um, but also on a kind of longer term time frame turkey the turkish state has been um, building a lot of dams detaining the water flow into rojava syria iraq as well in fact um, because turkey is like the most upstream of those countries under tigris and euphrates which then flow and feed um, into these other territories so this is the problem um, essentially a, a coalition of like cooperatives small charities and associations and, and kind of others um mostly in europe also in the middle east have come together to create a fund to be used for vital water infrastructure 
and water projects in Rojava in northeast Syria. So especially um, fixing damaged infrastructure, getting safe drinking water to people, but also um, supporting women's um, cooperatives like we talked about before. So we're working especially with Aborigine and the women's economy, which is why I was able to, I literally copy pasted into the chat if you saw that, um, some messages recently from our friends in the women's economy about cooperatives in the region. Um, so yeah, it launched on Saturday at midday, it's already over £15,000 and we actually have a match funding pledge from a foundation who are matching £1 for every £1 that we raise. So it means essentially we already raised over £30,000, which is already 30% of the target. So it's really exciting, um, it's going to launch, uh, sorry, it's going to run for another three and a half weeks. So um, we're also adding new, like, donations all the time coming from organizations co-ops kind of well-known people and things like that so keep an eye on the page and yeah spread the word support it thank you thanks so much joe um and there's a couple of other campaigns that we wanted to uh use this platform to promote so one i think you can now see the boycott website sarah can nod yeah okay good um so boycott turkey is a, a the uk branch of the boycott turkey campaign was launched last year around this time last year it's boycott-turkey.net um building on a number of calls that have been coming out for, for several years now um from kurdish communities uh also turkish and kurdish academics um uh, uh and several other several other groups from within turkey um and uh, in exile currently uh, asking for a boy for a boycott of Turkey in, in both its goods, um, but particularly its tourism and the institutions that are supporting uh, the Turkish state's violent actions, both within its borders and beyond. Um, so this campaign launched. We launched our social media uh, accounts last Monday. So you can find us on Instagram, on uh, Facebook, and on Twitter. Um, and we'd really like to grow this into as broad-based a civil society campaign as possible. So there's lots of different ways to get involved. Um, and, and if you'd like to, if you'd like to contribute to this campaign, then please send us a message at Kurdish Solidarity Network at riseup.net, um, because we'd this is a really important way of putting pressure on the Turkish state uh, and really building a broad base of support. And finally, the last campaign uh, it will be in solidarity with a currently imprisoned YPG volunteer from, uh, from the UK who was imprisoned at the end of last year uh, or was, has been held on remand since the end of last year, accused completely spuriously as ever of um, terrorism charges. Just a bit of background, this is often used by the British state uh, uh, as part of its really foreign relations with the Turkish state. Um, uh, used to attempt to criminalize people who'd been to northern east Syria to volunteer in various capacities and support the revolution uh, and they haven't successfully convicted anyone for this but they're continuing to do so and even in in this case combining it with the father and brother of another volunteer Dan Newey uh, who's in northern east Syria at the moment for so-called supporting um, them with uh, uh, that his acts of terrorism. So obviously this really shocking misuse of terrorism law and criminalization of solidarity. Um, their court case will begin, it's set to begin on October 26th um, and Sam and Paul are both on bail at the moment, but Dan Burke is still held in remand in uh, Wandsworth Prison in London. Um, so we're going to be launching a free Dan Burke campaign in the coming weeks, please look out for it. Uh, if you have messages of solidarity to send, you can get in touch. Uh, if there are ways in which you feel you support, then please get in touch um, because it's really uh, disgusting, especially at the moment with the with the COVID crisis that Dan is um, is stuck uh, in prison after everything that he did uh, for the struggle and for all humanity. So I think that's all of my ah um, oh no and final one final shout out then is if you enjoyed uh, this session and if you are a member of a group that you think could benefit from hearing about the experience on the ground in Rojava, from discussing some of these ideas 
uh, and if you'd like to discuss together with us how we can start to build a democratic movement, a dynamic social movement of the kinds that they've got on the ground in Kurdistan, then please get in touch with us at ksneducation at protonmail.com uh, because we'd really like to start running sessions like this more dedicated, private, for particular groups um, across these islands, really anywhere that, anywhere that you are, um, and to start learning together how we can build democratic confederalism and really a free life for everyone, uh, everywhere. So thank you very much to Scottish Solidarity with Kurdistan for having us. I'll hand over to Sarah now to uh, close off the meeting. Um, and thank you again to Vian for really fantastic discussion. Yes, thanks, Nick. Thanks, Vian. That was that was absolutely great. And yeah, um, I've got pages and pages of notes, actually. Um, just really, just to say, I want to end by saying thank you to you. Thanks to everybody for the questions and for the discussion. Um, and just to remind people about the, the meeting in two weeks time, which actually, you know, we've just heard about the, the case of the, the Newies and Dan Burke. I mean, this whole criminalization of anybody who's trying to put forward these ideas and to support these ideas and the, the use of terrorism legislation is just appalling. And it's, it's a really big issue, obviously, that the, the fact that you, you can't talk about the PKK without people saying it's, it's a terrorist issue so anyway next in in two weeks time we've got a, just a reminder that we've got Jan Furman who is the lawyer who um, defended quite a few members of the PKK it was a very 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 long period in the um, in the Belgian courts right up through the whole court system to basically say the PKK um, is not criminals, they're not terrorists, and successfully won that. So it's, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, obviously, these legal things are very technical and particular issues in particular places, but it's a win and it's inspiring, and it can give us ideas of, of you know, how, how we can organize against this whole criminalization of this whole movement. So really hope to see a lot of you there, and great to see you here today. So thanks. I shall end it, shall I? <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Chef Bosch. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.